Big news broke yesterday on the transfer portal with former starting running back Noah Kane entering his name, leaving Penn State and removing one name from the crowded backfield for the Nittany Lions. I'm your host, Thomas Frank Carr. Today on the BWI Daily Edition, we'll be talking about that with both our ho- our guest right now, Nate Bauer, and later with Greg Pickle as he gives his thoughts on the matter because you cannot talk too much about Noah Kane and the transfer portal. And of course, later in the show, he's also giving us a wrestling update for our wrestling fans. Um, we're going to be talking about that in a little bit, so stay tuned. But what Nate and I are going to talk about today... Uh, first Noah Kane, and then I dug into the tight ends and some of the frustration surrounding them in 2021. And I think I have an, a, a better way to look at their production other than throwing your hands up and saying the whole thing was bust. It was terrible. It was all bad. So that's what's coming up on the show today. Nate, thank you for coming on and thank you for uh, being here. How's everything going with you? Thanks for having me. I'm I'm great. How are you? I'm good. Uh, there's stuff to talk about, uh, good and bad. Sure. So that always, I, I, I said this to somebody else, I always feel better when I wake up in the morning and know exactly what we're doing on the show. That's always nice. It's the days where I wake up and I go, hmm, I'm going to have to put my creative pants on to find out what we're talking about today. Plenty of things to talk about. So for me, it's a good day. Uh, so your yeah. thoughts? Yeah, no, I mean, yesterday, yesterday was, um, look, I mean, I will say this, certainly Noah Kane's entrance into the, the transfer portal is the biggest name, right. Yep. That Penn state has had, uh, in terms of portal movement. I mean, certainly this year, you know, even if you go back to last year, uh, Antonio Shelton, I guess, um, you know, after the season, maybe, but yeah, probably the I best, mean, think, the biggest name since Justin Shorter to go in the transfer yeah, portal. Yeah, right. I mean, now, is it reflective of the 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 player that he is currently as the biggest name? Probably not. Right. right. Like, I mean, I, I don't think that there's any any real question uh, about the fact that there was a there was a basic proposition here for Penn State when they signed Nick Singleton and Catron Allen, which was John Lovett has to leave, right? Yep. He, he's exhausted his eligibility, but you can't carry six. You yep. can't have six scholarship running backs. Uh, and so who was the odd man out? You know, not sure, right? I mean, it's, yep. it's it, certainly there would have been, like if you would have asked me without knowing anything, just, just, Total guessing, Devin Ford might have been a possibility, right? Right, because uh, yep. I Holmes yep. might have been a possibility. I, I, I just given the amount of run that Noah Kane has had, expecting him to to be able to go into a, a senior season or at least a fourth season, even though he's been injured uh, a couple of times and missed missed some time. Yeah, you know, it it looked like a situation where he would not have been at the top of the list uh, of guys to make that exit. And yet, obviously, he made that call. So and let's make it official with there our it is. transfer portal. Oh, there's Noah Kane entering the portal and the portal now sending him off to a new destination. So uh, it's a little bit of a surprise. In a, in, a, in a way, given the way the season started for Noah Kane and some of the things that happened this season because of his injury, you would think that there's an explanation for what I'm about to show you. So as you pointed out when we were talking before the show, he was injured at some point. He didn't play, I think, in the Villanova game. But even with that, check out the split of what happened during the season. This is uh, his uh, weeks one through eight, 78 carries, 245 yards to lead the team. The rest of the way, and remember that first one through eight, that's with the injury we're talking about. Weeks nine through the bowl game, 28 carries for 105 yards yard. So when you look at it and you look at the the vanishing act that he did over time as the lead runner and as Kevon Lee started to pick up steam, you can go back and you can point to information like that, but the injury mid-season was was something that surprised me and I said it earlier this week, I think that there is a future for Noah Kane where he finally has a bounce back season if he can l- 
figuratively and literally land on his feet and go yep. through an off season healthy and get back to the strong physical running back that he was before. Um, I guess I'm still a little bit surprised that it's not Penn state, but with that room that you just talked about, uh, does this make things cleaner for Penn state? And are you expecting even not at Penn state, Noah Kane to be a name you hear about somewhere else that's succeeding for a different team? Yeah. I, I, look, I, I think that obviously he showed in 2019 uh, a a talent, right? I mean, he he wasn't a guy who necessarily was going to break one for 80, but he was going to get you really consistently five or six yards of carry. Um, that was just who he was and the type of consistency. And in fact, I mean, if, if you reflect on that time, that was one of the main frustrations of Penn State fans in 2019 was that James Franklin and staff didn't just go with Noah, right? They were still doing a, a split of carries with a few guys. Ricky Slade was in the mix. There, there were a bunch of guys that were were kind of divvying up carries. So, you know, obviously he got hurt towards the end, uh, like the last third of 2019. Yep. And then 2020, like, I mean, that's, that's really what we're talking about here is he hasn't been the same. Yep. Uh, he was able to come back for the cotton bowl, had a big breakout game in the cotton bowl. It was like, Hey, here's a guy who just got injured for the first time in his career, right. With what we all assume is a high ankle sprain, pushed through it, worked through it. Penn State didn't have to rush him back because they had other uh, available options that yep. season. Brought him back for the bowl game. He crushed it. Yep. He and Journey Brown, like, I mean, that was, like, that was a crazy game. I mean, they ran for 250 yards. Yeah. Uh, he had Journey like, Brown he had like, nuts. he had like, did he have over 100 of that game? I know he had two touchdowns, but the he both of them. Touchdowns. I think it was 90 something. Yeah. But, um, but yeah, no, I mean, you know, he, he went, he went nuts with journey in that game. And then for Penn state to lose and for both of those guys, right. Journey never played again. Yep. And then Noah King got hurt on the fourth play of the season, uh, in 2020 at Indiana. And so when Noah came back before the start of this past season, 2021, it was kind of this weird purgatory almost where James Franklin couldn't no one else right uh, among the Kevon Lees and um, the Kaziah Holmes, e even Devin Ford, no one had been so good during the 2020 season in Noah Kane's absence yeah. that they had just ascended into this starting role. And it wasn't like Franklin and staff were just giving Noah that job back without yeah. Right, probably, having to work for it. Probably the guy that ascended into that role was Will Levis, and he left for Kentucky. So, yep. yeah, yeah. I, so, yeah. Well, no. I, I mean, I was just gonna say, like Noah, Noah still demonstrated enough in uh, the preseason, right? And as he was yep. continuing to come back and back and back, that he was in good enough shape to be equal or better than the other options, right? Yep. And so he's, I mean, he started that Wisconsin game. And and, um, and the part that I think is a little bit disappointing for him is that he showed an ability even less than 100%. Because I said this whole yep. past season, he was not able to get back to the guy from 2019 because he was still rehabbing from that injury. I will, I'll say it a thousand times, I'll tell anyone that listens, that he was not the same guy and he didn't have the chance to be the same guy in 2021. But at the beginning of the season, he showed the ability to find ways to be productive and win, including in the passing game. And yep. then he got hurt and then the bottom fell out. And I just think that that's too bad for him that he sustained yet another injury that he tried to push through, but it limited his effectiveness in a limited environment. And, uh, you know, it's just one of those situations where he's leaving the, the, the university and I don't think anyone did anything wrong. I don't think that it's just it's just too bad that that yeah, I happened. Think, I, I think if if anything, that for his sake uh, and, and obviously Penn State's going to feel the same way, but. For his sake, coming back from that injury, Penn State would have hoped to have had a better pass or rush blocking operation. Right. right? right. Up, I mean, that's that's what we're talking about here is yeah. he wasn't that uh, people talk about it all the time. 
you you are constantly in football trying to make up for your deficiencies in as many areas as you possibly can. And in the running game, no one was everyone knows that the offensive line was not good enough. Yep. Okay. Sometimes you have a guy like Saquon Barkley behind an offensive line in 2017 that wasn't they weren't lights out. They weren't bad, but they weren't lights out. Yep. It was just so good that it eliminates that. Yep. Right. They can, and they can and Noah Kane in 2019. No, and he could in 2019 because when he yeah. had to break a tackle, he could he could get five yards through contact. And I'll just, I'll, you know, just so I'll, I'll throw this up here a bunch of times today when we're talking about Noah Kane. Look at his yards after contact per carry in 2019, 3.25. That's one of the best in the Big Ten that year. That would have been one of the best in the Big Ten this year. And without that lower body power, he's just not the same football player. And this yep. this number of 1.75 is bottom 10 in the Big Ten this year. And it's it's a number that is just simply not good enough. And yep. that's not to say he's not good enough, but his situation, and that's kind of what we talked about with the running game all season long is the, the offensive line obviously had some problems, but when they made good plays, you need the running back to still do something. And it was just a, it was a combination of toxic characteristics that all came together to make one of the worst rushing performances we've seen from Penn state in a long time. And this is just one of those factors. Well, let's not get carried away. They were worse in 2014. Okay. <laughs> and when, and <laughs> I said one of, you notice I didn't yeah. actually rank it because I don't know. I just know it's got to be one of the worst. <laughs> it's, it's important to note that 2014 was horrible. Awful. <laughs> so let's talk about the tight ends now, because that's a perfect transition uh, from, from also <laughs> horrible, but were they, but yeah. were they, that's yeah. That's what I went into. Uh, one of our one of our um, uh, message board members actually posted on our on the Lions Den message board, just asking the question: What what's up with the tight ends? What happened this year? Uh, so I want to preface this conversation. You've got the quote in front of you, so please read James Franklin's quote that sets up all the expectations for what the tight ends are supposed to be in 2021. Yeah. So this is this is from the preseason. He said, I think our tight end quote, I think our tight ends, you could make the argument that it's one of the best rooms that we've got from top to bottom. I'd make the argument. It's one of the best tight end groups in the country. In fact, it's the best tight end group I've ever been around in 25 years of coaching in college. Unquote. That's some lofty expectations. And, yeah, and I mean, he he doesn't say that like that's not yeah. that is not a quote that you're going to find very frequently from from James Franklin. Uh, sorry, I was trying to find who uh, asked that question, but uh, I'll get to that. They'll get they'll get a shout out in the message board. And by the way, if uh, if you want to join and you want to have a topic thrown out there in the message board, that is turns into a daily edition topic. It's perfectly acceptable, and you can do that if you sign up for Blue White Illustrated. One dollar at bluewhiteillustrated.com. Link is in the first uh, the first link in the description of this video. That is the link to join for just one dollar. Twelve months of access to Blue White Illustrated. Do that while you're subscribing to the channel, and then you're all locked in to get all your information from Penn State. Okay, so what are you waiting for? That's my question. I don't know. I don't know. And here's the other thing. Here's the other thing. So we're part of the on three network. You see the logo up in the corner. Um, I hate losing. I hate losing. And we get the numbers of how many people sign up. We can see, you can see how many people subscribe to the blue eyed illustrated YouTube channel. I am super proud of the job we do on this show. And like, this is going to get a little real joking to real. Like I am so proud of the job we do on this, on this channel. I think this is the best coverage you're going to get of, of college sports specifically college football on the Penn state beat and anywhere else. I will put what we do against anybody else. And the fact that we aren't number one, even within the on three network chaps, my butt every single day. So tell your friends, have everyone watch the show and let's beat Notre Dame. Okay. I'm tired of coming in second to Notre Dame. They do an awesome oh. job. I love Mike Singer. He's the guy that runs that channel. He's a, a lot of people. Don't, don't you want to like win Notre Dame, just in general, I mean, any chance you can, you can get to beat Notre Dame. Don't Penn state fans want that. I thought that I thought that was a thing 
And here we are sitting behind them in all of these metrics, and I'm just done with it. So I'm going to publicly call out our listeners to subscribe, tell your friends, and share this stuff. Because what we're going to get into here with the tight ends, I think, is, is the next level stuff we're talking about of, okay, so James Franklin talks about them as a room, right? The tight end yeah. room, the deepest, most talented he's ever been around. And that complicates things to a certain degree because you don't have a Mike Kosicki and you don't have a Pat Fryermuth to focus your attention on. So let me just show you their overall receptions. So this is... If you added up all the tight end receptions by, I'm sorry, that's not the one. This is the one I want. If uh, if you add up all the receptions, 48 receptions, 521 yards. That is second, uh, or I'm sorry, third on the team. Now, obviously, the drops are a problem. If you the two leading uh, tight ends drop the ball 10 percent of the time, roughly, so that's not great. But if you just break out Bretton Strange from when he was the lead receiver at Penn State, he only had uh, 10 receptions, 139 yards, and two touchdowns. So you're talking about a, a, an evaluation of an entire room, and then when you do it at the end of the season, you say that was a huge disappointment because they didn't produce. But is that the truth of the individuals? So I guess we'll start with that of... When it comes to the individuals, was there anyone to you that stood out as a positive in that group outside of the overall negative of the narrative? Yeah, I mean, you know, look, I, th I think that they all had some moments, right? I mean, I, certainly I can think back on plays and contributions that Tyler Warren made. I can think on plays and contributions that Brenton strange had and, and the same for Theo Johnson. I mean, I, I don't think that there is any question that they were able to contribute. It was just the frequency of, of that, right? Yep. I mean, the consistency was never really there. And so I, I think that I'm, I remember a James Franklin quote. I don't remember at what point in the season it was, I think uh, somewhere around the middle, right? Yeah. Where James Franklin said, really that almost laid it out as the secret sauce was, Hey, this offense is unlocked and is able to do better things when the tight ends are involved. And yeah. to be honest with you, I think it was after the Ohio state game. I mean, the Ohio state game was one of the more productive games that they've had offensively yep. all season. They didn't score the points, but against that defense on the road, I mean, I don't know. Maybe, maybe you feel differently. I mean, I think that that was that was the best performance that they had. Yeah, Penn State's tight ends were were an active part of that. Yep, so, and that was actually yeah, a game I mean, that both. We'll get to it in a second, but that was a game that both of the tight, both of the receiving tight ends, and I'll show you what I mean in a minute, were involved in the game plan. And yep. as, as much as James Franklin makes that comment of getting the tight ends involved and in, and in that part. This was an offense dominated by Jahan Dotson and Parker Washington. So everyone was fighting for third. And that's where I think you have the opportunity to make a couple of plays, but no one had the real chance outside of uh, those top two to be an everyday contributor in the offense. So when you're evaluating these guys, first off, just from a production standpoint, it was not good enough. I'll show you, and I, I'm parsing these things out, but... Overall, it wasn't good enough. Individually, none of these guys took their opportunities and made enough of it. But here is what my point and, and the point of this particular conversation is. As receivers, Brenton Strange got nine weeks to be the guy. 24 targets, 14 receptions, 153 yards, three touchdowns. That's, that's not good enough. Theo Johnson then replaces him, and Brenton Strange does not get as many targets. 16 targets, 13 receptions, 101 yards, and Tyler Warren got a grand total of nine targets all season long and had some of the most impressive of the plays, but he got nine targets. So if you're Bre if you're Brenton Strange and okay, you had a couple of moments early in the season, but you weren't getting the job done and then you don't get any more targets. How are you supposed to come back from that? How are you supposed to change that narrative? Theo Johnson had some really good moves up the seam that I remember individual plays that were good, but made too many mistakes. And the drops are another part of it. Both of those guys dropped about 10% of their passes. You just can't do that. But how do you change that narrative if you don't get any more opportunities because your positional opportunities are now going to somebody else? Yeah, I mean, 
certainly I can remember, and I think that everyone <laughs> probably can. Strange struggled in that Iowa game, right? Yeah. When Taquan Roberson came in, like, yep. Roberson had problems very clearly, but there were some occasions where Penn State's receiving options could have helped out and had opportunities to do so by making a play and it didn't get done. Yep. So no, nah, I mean, I, I, I agree. It's it <laughs> look it, it, whether it's the tight, whether we're talking about the tight ends, really even the receivers and running backs, all of the skill position guys for, for Penn state's offense this season outside of Jahan Dotson. It, can, can we talk about anybody in, in a, in a truly met their potential, right? Like who, yeah. are, who, who are we looking at in that group that today? And I, and I'm uh, certainly, I think that all three of those guys at tight end would say the same thing is, yep. yeah, there, there, there were elements that were good from the season, but no one would probably feel as though they had reached what their aspirations were coming into the season. Yeah. And it's so it's it's so interesting because one of the things I think of when I think of uh, all of the all of the players on offense getting to eat, right, all of them getting the opportunity. If you don't have a lot of plays, you can't give everyone the football. Correct. But that's not the case. Penn State went on 15 play drives. It wasn't like they were one shot. And, or or a ton of three and outs. They put together seven, eight play drives regularly. It's just they all went to Jahan Dotson and they all went to Parker Washington. So, you know, yeah. and nobody, and this is the other half, is nobody, nobody got those big plays routinely at other positions. You know, even when you got a big play, maybe it was 15 yards from a tight end, or it was nobody could break that tackle and get a touchdown and well, and kind of change the narrative about all of that. You, I think that you can probably speak to this better than I can. How, how much of that did you feel was a, a byproduct of the fact that the offensive line couldn't protect, right? Couldn't, yeah. couldn't really unblock or pass block. And so in, in that sense, I mean, I'm just, I'm curious to, if, if we looked back on the season, one of the things that, that, Again, James Franklin said when the the running game started to make, and I, I think that this is demonstrated through the stats, the running game did start to take baby steps. Yes, right to, yep. from the middle of the season to the end of the season, there were baby steps and and some signs of life, and those signs of life he kind of pointed out week after week after week w included better, more physical blocking from the tight ends. Like they had to be a, a part of, uh, of that. Did you, I set you up? Did I you, tee you? You, Are you good? set me up perfectly because am I, am I wrong? Is that like a total fallacy? No, no, that's <laughs> so that's the other giant misconception about the, the 2021 season for the tight ends, because I say tight end run blocking and Nate, you say, like what's the what's the common theme? What's the thing you hear time and time again about the tight ends as run blockers in 2021? No. They weren't good enough. No. Yeah, they weren't good enough. No, for sure. So for here, sure. but but, but let's say otherwise. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So that was the thing is everyone remembers. I think it was after the Villanova game that James Franklin specifically called out the tight ends, saying the offensive line needs to block, and honestly, the tight ends need to do a better job too. And people latch onto that. And he may have said things, but not as loudly later in the season. So I just want to show you the timeline I found of Brenton Strange's uh, blocking in 2021. So first three weeks of the season, 49.9 grade run blocking, according to PFF. That is that is uh, that qualifies as not good enough. Makes subpar. the comments. Yes. No, it's beyond subpar. That's actively hurting your team. Franklin makes the comments about blocking in week four and for the rest of the season. Brenton Strange has a run blocking grade of 84.8, .8, which is borderline great. That is solidly very good. That is a well above average. So Brenton Strange, his, his season ending grade was, you know, a little bit lower than that. But for most of the season, he was a good run blocker. He didn't have the opportunities in the second half of the season as a, as a receiver. But to your point, and this is another point about the bowl game specifically, is I saw him open. I saw Theo Johnson open in the bowl game. They did not get targets. That's not yeah. their fault. 
So there is some about that when it comes to the tight ends. Now, when they did get opportunities in the regular season, it didn't happen. As a run blocker, there's no other easy narrative for the other two, but Tyler Warren showed flashes of being a good football player when he was given the opportunity. So if you, again, this is all based on PFF run blocking grade. And what I noticed is when he was involved in the game, more times than not, he was good. He wasn't as the third tight end always involved in the game. So let's take a look at where he had 10 or more run blocking attempts. His PFF run blocking grade is 75.2. So if he came in for two or three plays and didn't really get in the rhythm of the game and had one bad block, I'm not holding that against him. That is a good run blocking grade from a former quarterback who's a big physical tight end. The one who never really improved was the Canadian wide receiver, Theo Johnson, yeah. whose run blocking grade for the whole season. There, there's very little redeeming here, 50.5. The only games he had a grade above 60, Wisconsin, Ohio State, and Rutgers. Ohio State was the high watermark for him as a football player, where he was a good receiver. He blocked well on that game. He had a very good grade, but it was never a consistent thing there. So once again, even if you break out the, the narrative about tight ends weren't good at blocking, it's three different people. Of course, one of them's going to be okay, one of them's going to be good, and one of them's going to be bad. But people are remembering the low lights of each one of them combined together. Uh, can I go to the back to the quote machine? Sure, please, please. <laughs> let's, let's travel to a more innocent time. Uh, November 10th. And it, and it, it struck me. I pulled this, <laughs> I pulled this specifically because, um, the question was about Lee, right. And being a better runner, like kind of starting to assert himself. Yeah. Uh, I think it was coming. I don't have the dates in front of me, but I think that was after the Maryland game. It was right? at, yes, uh, because that was a game where he had eight carries for 52 yards. Yep. Yeah. So <laughs> quote about whether or not Lee had been more decisive, asserted himself, whatever, right? Quote, I think he has been a little bit more decisive. I also think we've gotten more push. I think we're being more physical up front at the tight end position and the offensive line positions. What? Well, I mean, let's drop the mic. They like, just leave. Yeah. There's nothing else to say. <laughs> no, I just, no, so but I, I, it, I'm just, it, it speaks to it, right? It yep. speaks to the fact that there was, there was progress there. There were things that were, that started to advance and you're right. I mean, if you're, if you're taking it on the whole, I think that certainly, I mean, it, it's, it's tough to parse an offense that just struggled as much as it did yeah. to cash in. Like it, I mean, the, 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 the thing that's going to be very interesting to look back on as we get into the, the spring and summer and can like take this crazy deep dive on last season is you're right. I mean, they had the 28th ranked passing offense in the country. Yeah. So for as bad as the rushing offense was, it's not like they didn't move the ball. Yeah. They just didn't score. <laughs> and if they had scored, right, which is uh, certainly uh, an area that Penn State has had a ton of impact and a ton of success at the tight end position, is guys like Pat Fryermuth scoring bunches and bunches of touchdowns. Yep. That just didn't happen. That just didn't happen for these guys this season because – they weren't effective in the red zone. Yeah, they weren't effective in the red zone and they didn't break enough tackles. And I think that's, that's, yep. I keep coming back to that of in that particular offense with the quarterback and the offensive line you're working with, your, your receivers have to do a little bit more. You have to do something outside of the expected. And the tight ends did less than that with some drops. And then they didn't, when they had the ball in their hands, they didn't play with physicality after the catch and make those plays, which I think at this point, you and I both think that they're capable of that still, right? The talent didn't disappear. So if you're saying in yep. 2022, you've got two good run blockers for sure. And one guy who is still learning the position in Theo Johnson. I think that's fair to say as far as his run blocking and all those things, but a, yep. a, an exceptionally talented receiver we saw at the end of the season. You can still project positivity out of them. I don't think that this has to be, I guess the whole point of this particular segment for me was, guys, the house isn't on fire. Like, yes, the, the oven, there was some smoke. The smoke alarm went off, but it nothing, nothing is, there's no scorched earth here. It'll be okay as long as these guys continue to do what they've done, which is work hard on their game. Yep. No, and that's, I'm glad you said that, is I think one of the defining characteristics is it's not like, uh, particular or specific to the tight ends 
that they, they, they're a good group of dudes. Like they're, they are, they work hard at it. They work together. They work well together. Um, that, that was one of the, the, uh, you know, core tenets of what Ty Howell, who obviously it was his first year as tight ends coach, what he said, how he described that group was, was how well they play off of each other, how well they practice together, how well they push each other. Um, and so if that's the culture within your room of getting better, and a- as you're really speaking to through the course of this segment and this show, it's there. It, it might not be, it might not be readily apparent, but if, if progress, if you're getting just a little bit better on a consistent basis, give it an off season, yeah. give it an off season and see what, uh, maybe some better circumstances for next season, uh, can produce. Yep. And if just going away from the stats, going to my personal analysis of these guys, if there's one thing that especially Brenton strange, I think needs to do it's get painfully open embarrassingly open and then your quarterback will throw you the football because I I don't think that there's ever been any doubt that Sean Clifford is going to be conservative with the football over the middle after 2022 or 2020, which is what I think speaks to some of the issues getting the football to the tight ends is, is I've just seen too many instances of guys on crossing routes where if you throw with anticipation or you throw with accuracy between two guys, that play is one that good quarterbacks make. And Sean seemed a little bit hesitant to throw those. If he gets over that and then takes the next step in 22, or if another quarterback sees the field, we might see something different in terms of contested catches and all that stuff. So that's just my final read on uh, this particular topic is the look forward. Anything from you going forward with the tight ends? Well, I'm just, I'm now, now you've piqued my interest. Can you reflect uh, off the top of your head? How many of Clifford's interceptions in 2020 were over the middle Uh, off the top of my head. It's a few at least. (laughs) So (laughs) the ones that, the ones that come to mind uh, was the, the very first one of the season against Indiana where he overthrew Pat Fryermuth by a good 10 yards. Um, And then I, there there's other ones that, that come to mind, but the, it's not necessarily ones I can specifically speak on, but yeah, that was a lot of the problem was, was trying to do too much, hold on the ball and then target things over the middle that w- might've been there, but not with the pass that was thrown. Yep. Uh, so that'll do it for here. <laughs> We're going to peter out and then we're going to do a quick transition and be back with Greg Pickle. He's going to tell us about his thoughts on Noah Kane transferring and uh, wrestling. So stay tuned on the BWI Daily Edition. Welcome back to the BWI Daily Edition. I'm your host, Thomas Frank Carr. I'm still here. Joining me now is Greg Pickle. He is, first off, an amazing reporter at Blue White Illustrated. Read his work at bluewhiteillustrated.com, covering Penn State football, Penn State wrestling. Uh, Greg, do you do any basketball? I know you do a bunch of stuff for us. Have you have you dabbled there yet uh, in what you've been covering for Blue White Illustrated? Yeah, no. Hey, T. Frank, I let Nate and Dave handle that. They're the experts on hoops, and uh, I, I don't profess to have any expertise or anything else on a college basketball except for maybe the tournament so i let those guys handle that but hey oh but you you know the gambling part you you know the part where you where you're going to put a bracket together that's for sure yeah no doubt about that but no i let those guys handle it it's been a fun start to the uh micah shrewsbury air and we'll see where it goes from here so we're here to talk about wrestling primarily uh, here on the Daily Edition with Greg because uh, it's, uh, you know, another stellar start to the season for Penn State wrestling, but they've been battling through some adversity, which we'll get to. But speaking of adversity, the first thing we have to talk about today after last night, the news broke, Noah Kane entering his name into the transfer portal. Uh, you were one of the first to report on that for us. So what were your thoughts on Noah Kane making that announcement? Was it a surprise at all to you? Yeah, you know, I think that we both probably would agree that it's very it was very likely once the 2021 season ended, T. Frank, that at least one Penn State running back, if not maybe two, were going to end up in the transfer portal. Obviously, we'll see what happens from here. But if you were putting odds on the guy who was the favorite to go into the transfer portal, I'm really not sure I would have made Noah Kane the favorite. I don't know where you stand on that. I'm sure we'll find out here in a minute. But yeah, I don't think I would have expected him to be the most likely guy to be the first running back into the transfer portal. But it's a bummer for sure. I mean, his Penn State career was derailed by injuries. There was a time there in 
2019 that it really looked like he was going to be the next great Penn State running back and the injury bug just bit and it bit hard and he just never was really the same guy since and he goes down at obviously Indiana very early in the 2020 season and you know he had a big touchdown against Wisconsin this year but I think he only finished with about 350 yards so I know Penn State fans will be rooting for him wherever he ends up next and where that is you know, I would assume probably back closer to home, Texas, Louisiana, somewhere down in you know a school in one of those states, maybe a Sun Belt's team or things like that, or maybe a little bit higher. I don't know. It's going to be interesting to see how he's perceived by schools in the transfer portal because, again, when he was at his best, he was really good. I mean, he yep. was among the Big Ten's best running backs when he was at his best. The question just becomes how far is he from his best and can he get back there with the injury setbacks he had? So yeah. I guess not a total surprise, but again, I would have thought maybe another guy would end up in the portal at that position. Maybe one still will. We'll see. Yeah. But At least somebody yeah, else first, right? You wouldn't have expected Noah right. Kane to be the first guy. And like I talked about with Nate a little bit earlier, his snaps diminished as the season went on, but it was clear that he wasn't healthy. So right. that's why, to me, it's a bit of a surprise is that I even on Monday, as of Monday, I was talking about I think that 2022 can be a resurgent year for him because he's a guy that there's an obvious reason he wasn't productive. And I'll put this up here again so everyone can see it. But this is clear to me that the health that, as you said, the injuries just sapped him of his ability to break tackles and get yards after contact. 2019, he was that guy. And then in 2021, it just clearly wasn't. So there's if there's a reason or an explanation for for a guy struggling like that, that's not surprising, but I guess the the loss of snaps and the loss of his role as the season went on was that a uh, deciding factor for Noah Kane. Do you think he can be that guy in 2022? Do you think, are you expecting a resurgence from Noah Kane wherever he lands next? Yeah, I mean, the question, I think he just kind of hit the nail on the head. The question all comes down to his health, right? And, yeah. you know, opportunity can be the greatest way to get healthy in some respects. I mean, it was just a weird year for Penn State in the running back room. It's been talked about ad nauseum, so we don't need to go too deep into reliving what was just a horrendous year for the rushing offense in state college. But, you know, they rotated guys. Nobody was really the hot hand. Then Kevon Lee was kind of the hot hand, but they didn't really run the ball at all, especially in the Outback Bowl. So, you know, maybe Noah Kane gets somewhere and he's able to be the guy and be the one that gets all the reps in practice, be the one that is the man on game day. And perhaps that gets him uh, to use the word you just used, uh, a resurgence in 2022. I, and look, I think, again, Penn State fans respect the heck out of this kid and we're really excited when he came to Penn State as a recruit and understand that the the challenges he's faced have been related to injuries and not really anything else. And he's worked so hard to get back on the field and be ready to go. So maybe it's just a fresh start that he needs, T. Frank. I believe he is going to graduate, so he'll be a grad transfer. And perhaps he just needs one year in a different place with a different system. And that will propel him to a better 22, uh, 22 season and then a better uh, future in football than maybe what we're expecting right now. But, you know, again, it really just comes down to how healthy is he and can he stay healthy once he gets yeah. on the field? Yep. Yep. And and that's with his, the, the funny thing is with his physical running style, uh, his issues have been just bad luck as far as the injuries he sustained of, I don't even know really what the injury was, you know, how it happened. It seemed like it was a mild contact injury at the beginning of the 2020 season. Like he wasn't, I don't think his foot was stepped on or anything. Uh, and of yeah. course we don't know the exact nature of any of these injuries, but it just seems like for a guy that was as physical as he was and his talents were in that arena, um, he didn't sustain a lot of big hits that that derailed him. They were much more subtle things that happened to uh, to Noah Kane, especially seeing as like we were surprised. I remember watching the game and being surprised that he was even out against Indiana. You didn't see any massive collision or anything like that. So hopefully for his he sake, carries, I think is all it was too. Yep. You know, it wasn't like he was in there getting pounded and things like that. That's probably the the greatest shame of it all is that, yeah. you know, all the work he did to get back on the field and blah, blah, blah from there. And then just as quick snap of a finger, he's out again. And, and as you pointed out, they were running the ball on that opening drive against Indiana. That was their plan for the season was to ride Noah Kane. And then he can't be out there for them to do that. That, that was another unfortunate part of his career and how it just didn't work at Penn state that I don't think anyone's really at fault because they really wanted him to be a part of, of the central part of the offense, even coming into this season where he got nicked up once again. So with that in mind, 
what uh, is what does the running back room look like in your opinion? And is this now a paved pathway for one of those true freshmen to take off and be a main contributor in 2022? Yeah, it certainly could be. I mean, I think that anyone who's going to want the first team job is going to have to go through Kevon Lee. I don't really think there's any way around that. And I think he deserves that opportunity to be the lead guy. But Penn State has so much to figure out in that running back room that I think it's still a little bit too early to really try and make any assumptions or any guesses about what uh, personnel usage is going to be because we just saw nothing consistent this year. And quite frankly, I think you'll agree, they kind of need to just blow up the whole plan that they had for the run game in 2021, start over. And whether it's the offensive line, whether it's the running backs, whether it's a little bit of everything, I'm sure it is. Yeah. You know, Yvonne Lee is the leader in that room as far as I'm concerned, but you have Devin Ford, you have Keziah Holmes, you have Nick Singleton, Katrin Allen, who are both on campus with the opportunity to win that job or at least put a foot toward winning that job during spring practice. But to me, it starts and ends with Kevon Lee, and then we'll see where things go from there. Yeah, and the first part of the show, we were talking about the tight end blocking, and we were talking about some of the misconceptions based on what I saw on film and then what I went back and looked at and really uh, came to the conclusion of this past week when looking at the tight ends as a whole. They actually got better as blockers as the season went on, especially Tyler Warren and Brenton Strange. So to me, the running backs are simply a symptom of of the real issue, which we all know is the offensive line. And I've been doing a lot of work this week on the offensive line, and uh, it's all leading up to what I am am gonna do tomorrow, which is we're gonna start projecting the starting offensive line for next season, some line combinations from maybe the best ideal all the way to the most realistic, and then some worst case scenarios in between. So stay tuned for that at bluewhiteillustrated.com, where you can check out that for just $1. Sign up for a dollar, and you get 12 months of access to Blue White Illustrated all the way through next season. So you get to read all of our reporting this offseason on transfers, our assessment of the roster, all those things coming up in the winter workouts, and of course, wrestling inside information on that on the blue white illustrated message board which is what we're getting to now with greg as far as looking at what's going on with penn state wrestling and they got a familiar face back uh this past week tell me about brady berge and his uh journey through college at this point with some pretty dramatic twists and turns right yeah, it's been quite the journey for Brady Berge, a guy who's a two-time NCAA qualifier at Penn State. His career ended with a medical forfeit uh, in his what was his last match, now no longer his last match. Um, and, you know, it's really interesting because he retired in April of 2021 from competing because of concussions and to focus on his health. Um, and he went to South Dakota State where he was a graduate assistant or I'm sorry, a volunteer assistant rather. Um, and now all of a sudden here we are January 2022 and he's coming back for one final season with the Lions. I think it's great. You know, Penn State needs a score at either 157 or 165. I, and, you know, they have guys there in Tony Negron and Creighton Etzler right now who could be that score. But it never hurts to throw another body into the mix who could win that job. And we'll see which weight class he ultimately competes at and which, uh, you know, if he can win uh, a spot in the starting lineup, which is expected but not assured. And I just think it's a great story, again, you know, for a guy to come back after a health scare and having to retire and so on and so forth to be able to come back and try and have one final season uh, that ends on a better note. And yeah. so it'll be interesting to see what Penn State decides to do with him. Kelsey Anderson saying on Tuesday of this week that at this point, they're just getting him into the room. Obviously, as an assistant coach, you know, those guys are rolling around. They're practicing with other wrestlers. My point being, they're in better shape than you would expect. Is yeah. he in match shape already? I, I don't know. I mean, he's probably close. He might not be all the way there. So we'll see if he wrestles on Sunday or not. But uh, really good story and excited to see how it plays out. Yeah, so that would that was going to be my next question is what what do you expect from that in the short term? Uh, and then in the long term, what do you expect from this edition? Yeah, so I mean, the short term, I guess <laughs> if you're using recent history and as, as an example, you know, Penn State said that they weren't sure if Drew Hildebrandt, the other midseason edition, would be ready for last weekend's two matches. And sure enough, he started both of them. So <laughs> if you're using that as an example, there's a decent chance we'll see Brady Berge on, uh, on Sunday when Rutgers comes to town. But I could also see them giving him a week to get in the room, to beat out. You know, the guys who are already at the two possible weight classes for him, he's listed at both, again, 157 and 165 on the roster. So we'll see. But long term, by the time we get to March, I would be pretty surprised if he's not part of Penn State's Big Ten tournament lineup and then NCAA tournament lineup. So 
it may take a little bit longer than most fans would like or expect, but ultimately I do believe that we will see him in action uh, in the spring when it comes postseason tournament time. So another thing about wrestling for people that are unfamiliar with the sport, and this is the BWI Daily Edition. I'm your host, Thomas Frank Carr. I'm also pretty unfamiliar with the sport. Uh, Greg is our wrestling reporter. They got another mid-season edition, and unlike other sports, because they cross that that um, semester threshold, a guy like Drew Hildebrandt coming into the program can compete as a part of the lineup. So how does his addition, along with Brady Berge and all these things, how does that change the lineup and how do lineup changes happen for people that don't understand how that works in the room? Yeah. So, I mean, obviously Penn state set its lineup before the season began. And you know, the one thing with Kale Sanderson, for those who haven't followed this program is the lineup you see during the first half of the year. So of course, obviously we started it with a 2021 portion of the schedule. Now there's a 2022 portion of the schedule and it's very rare for the first lineup and the last lineup of the dual season to be the same. So this is not totally uncommon. Maybe it is to have two midseason additions, but to change to have a changing lineup is not anything that's out of the norm in the Kale Sanderson era. So at any rate, you know, uh, Penn State had some guys at 125 who were trying. I mean, they were really uh, working hard to score points for Penn State and more importantly, not give up bonus points in uh, dual matches earlier this year. But you didn't really see a lot of opportunity for those guys. I mean, maybe they would have qualified for the NCAA tournament, but would they have scored points there? It's highly unlikely. So you go out and get Drew Hildebrandt, who is a two-time All-American from Central Michigan. He comes in at 125. The expectation was he would give Penn State a chance in that weight class against Iowa Spencer Lee, who has now since ended his season opting for double knee surgery, so he's not even competing anymore, Yikes. which gives Penn State even a bigger leg up, uh, so to speak, in the 125-pound weight class. But, you know, at this point, you know, he comes in. I'm sure he won. If he, I'm not even sure if they had to wrestle off, but if they did, I'm sure he won, and that earned him the spot. But, you know, to your point, they do have wrestle off sometimes it's just a match sometimes it's best two out of three or whatever it needs to be to make the coaching staff and the wrestlers uh, clear that one guy is the winner of that spot and then he Mm -hmm. has that spot until he either gives it up for some reason or you know the other guy improves so much that they feel the need to to do that process again so with Brady Berge you know that's where they're at right now Kale Sanderson saying Tuesday that they were still deciding I mean he only got here on Sunday we're talking on Thursday so at this point I'm sure they have a pretty good idea what their plan is for this coming Sunday against the Scarlet Knights but on Tuesday, they were deciding when, you know, how many are they going to wrestle off at 57 and 65? Are they going to just wrestle off at one spot? Is he going to go 57 or 65? Where is mm-hmm. he most likely to be uh, come tournament time? Where do they need the most points come tournament time? You know, is Tony Negron a guy who can score points at 57? Is Creighton Etzel a guy who can score points at 65? Those are the two starters right now. So we'll see how this all shakes out. But I do find it, you know, interesting that. You know, the the quote from Kale Sanderson that was the main takeaway was we ask our kids to compete and we as coaches compete. What he means by that is, is that they're always looking for ways to make their lineup as strong as possible. And that's how we get to this point where in January they make two pretty big mid-semester additions uh, to try and bolster this lineup before the uh, postseason tournaments begin. Now, I don't want to uh, make any assumptions. So can you tell me right now where Penn State is ranked and their record heading into this weekend where they have another Big Ten duel? Yeah, so Penn State is now number one in the country, according to uh, Intermat. I I could throw a dart at a week in the season, and that would have been the case, but I just wanted to make sure that was correct, so I didn't say anything incorrect. So, sorry, continue. So, uh, Rutgers comes to town this weekend. Uh, Penn State is 10-0, looking to run its schedule to 11-0. Should be an interesting uh, interesting weekend here. Penn State will definitely be the favorite, but Rutgers, according to Intermat, has some guys ranked pretty highly. I'm just looking here to make sure I have all of the numbers correct. Uh, There's going to be a great match at 141 where Nick Lee and uh, Sebastian Rivera square off in a battle of two top five guys. Uh, They're 184-pounders ranked number five, 197s ranked number seven. Penn State, of course, is... Uh, Number one at 184 with Aaron Brooks and number two at 197 with Max Dean. But, you know, again, Penn State's a favorite in this match. But, T. Frank, as we've talked about before and we hit on a little bit with the midseason lineup changes, there's also been match-to-match changes with this Mm -hmm. lineup based on illness, based on availability. They had a brutal stretch with illness back in, uh, you know, November and December that caused some lineup changes. And then they had an issue at – 
uh, against uh, Indiana on Sunday where they had two starters out because of not feeling well, being under the weather. So, you know, obviously there's a lot going around right now, and these guys try their best to stay healthy and stay away from uh, contracting any kind of illness, but it happens. And so these lineups, while they look good on paper for both sides, and it should be a very competitive match, you got to wait and see who weighs in on Sunday, who actually takes them out on Sunday, because unfortunately, it's just a fact of life now for all teams competing in all sports across really college, uh, college and the NFL. You just never know when a guy or, or girl, whatever sport it is, is going to test positive yeah. or have the flu and they're going to want to keep that person away or cold or whatever because they don't want the rest of the team getting sick. So should be a great match on Sunday. We'll keep our fingers crossed. That's going to be televised live on ESPNU. Awesome. Uh, well, Greg, thank you so much for the information. And if you want to check out his article, he's got a full breakdown coming up tomorrow, correct? Yes. Yep. Uh, it'll be at blueitillustrated.com on Friday. Yep. All right. Thank you so much for the information. Appreciate you coming on the show. Always enjoy having Greg on the show. I'm your host, Thomas Frank Carr. That'll do it for today. If you're here at the outro music, give the video a like. You enjoyed it. You you even learned something new. If you're a football fan here for the Noah Kane stuff, you learned some stuff about wrestling. So give the video a like. Subscribe to Blue Light Illustrated wherever you get your podcasts and on YouTube. I'm your host, Thomas Frank Carr. We'll talk to you tomorrow.